Can you talk about the connection between sugar, blood pressure, diabetes? Yep. So basically, I came out with a paper in BMJ Open Heart that we blamed the wrong white crystals, right? We we blamed salt for all the harms that really are caused by sugar. And what I try to tell people is people will say, well, when I consume salt, doc, I get edema, my, my feet swell, or my blood pressure increases. And what I tell them is, is what's probably going on is you've consumed a diet high in sugar and refined carbs. You have high insulin levels. You're over-retaining salt. So don't blame salt for what the sugar did. Cut the sugar, reduce the insulin, and stop over-retaining salt, and you probably won't have swelling or increases in blood pressure with salt. And so salt is never the primary problem. It can't be because our blood is salty. We are literally salty. So it's something, some underlying condition is causing you to not be able to tolerate a normal amount of salt. And I go in my book, some of the more common causes like high aldosterone levels, high cortisol, low potassium, low magnesium, high sugar. If you can fix all those underlying issues, 99% of the time you don't have to worry about consuming a normal salt diet. Yeah, and in your book, you you highlight the fact that low salt increases insulin anywhere from ten to fifty percent. So, can you talk about how increasing salt can actually be beneficial for for people with blood sugar dysfunction? Yeah, salt is kind of the opposite of sugar. It's like the yin and yang; those two white crystals, salt being good, sugar being bad. And so, I actually have come across studies where reducing salt intake can increase fasting insulin by over a hundred percent. And can wow. increase insulin AUC, meaning if you consume, let's say, 75 grams of glucose and you look at the insulin assay and you look at insulin AUC or the area under the curve, low salt diets can actually increase that area under the curve of insulin by up to 70%. And so that's one of the earliest diagnoses of prediabetes and diabetes is hyperinsulinemia via that insulin assay. And so low salt diets have basically the same effect on your body when it comes to insulin resistance as high sugar diets. And as you mentioned, I mean, yeah, the more sugar people are consuming, we're losing salt, and of course the cycle sort of continues, right, in terms of cravings for, for uh, high sugar foods, processed carbohydrates, etc. cetera. Yeah, um, what's really cool when I was researching for the book, probably in my opinion, the most interesting fact that I learned was when an animal gets depleted in salt, Somehow they know to search out a salt lick and consume more salt, but how do they know to do that? And so the body, and this happens in humans as well, the body's brain will basically activate, super activate the reward system so that you crave salt and when you get when you consume salt and you find it in the diet, it tastes better. You get a better reward, a higher reward. Unfortunately, sugar and drugs of abuse can hijack that activated reward system when we're deficient in salt. So literally, salt deficiency in low salt diets could be potentially driving sugar and drug addiction. Yeah, it's amazing. I mean, I had Dr. Stefan Guiné on, and of course, uh, you're talking about this hyperpalatability of foods, and of course, uh, with, with all the uh, processed foods and sugars around us, it's no wonder that people should be adding more salt, or just uh, it's easy to, to pick up the um, sweet foods, processed foods, snack foods, etc., and just further drive this, this dysfunction. Yeah, no, what's really cool about salt too, because it's an essential nutrient, it's the only taste that will actually flip its receptors when you get too much. And so you have this inherent safety mechanism when it comes to over consuming salt, where we know with sugar, the cravings for sugar only get worse the more you consume. And we know this through population intake level. We know when sugar was introduced in the 1700s in Europe, the consumption was only four pounds per person per year, but within just a couple hundred years, it went up to 150 pounds. Whereas salt, a couple hundred years ago, we consumed up to 10 times as much salt. And once we dropped uh, salt as the main preservative and we had refrigerators, the intake of salt actually went down and has remained in a very narrow range, about eight to 10 grams of salt for the last 50 to 60 years, which again shows you that our body controls salt intake, whereas dependence and addiction control sugar intake very well said and of course that dovetails into the question which is you know what is the ideal dose of salt is there an ideal dose for people yeah i I honestly don't think we necessarily have the answer but with that being said what we see in population studies is the patients that are at lowest risk of cardiovascular events and all-cause mortality 
have a 24-hour sodium in their urine of between three to 6,000 milligrams of sodium, which is one and a third teaspoon to two and two-thirds teaspoons of, sodium, uh, of salt. And so that is much more than the less than one teaspoon of salt that every single dietary guideline tells us. And are there certain people on medications that should be mindful of in terms of the amount of salt that they're taking in? Yeah, so one of the most common reasons for the elderly to have low sodium levels in the blood is they're on diuretics. So diuretics are just obviously big salt wasters. And so people should listen to their internal salt cravings because there's things like caffeine that cause massive amounts of salt loss and diuretics. And there's, you know, we do a lot of other things throughout the day like exercise or it might be hot out. And so we should just be listening to our salt cravings. When we're, when we're getting a craving for something salty, we should consume it because it's our body's way of telling us that we're deficient in it. That dovetails perfectly into my next question. I mean, here in clinical practice, I work a lot with uh, athletic populations, um, team sport, but also endurance athletes. And of course, sweat loss during exercise is a big question in terms of you know how much salt do folks need uh, to, to replenish that during training? Is there a, a general guideline or what are the implications there for l- lack of salt in terms of your athletic performance? That's such a great question. It's because we fear salt so much now the athletic community is just starting to realize the benefits of dosing themselves with salt prior to enduring exercise. And I cover this pretty, pretty in depth in my book. And so it's really funny because even in the 1970s, the British soccer team, when they played Mexico in Mexico for the world cup, they consumed slow releasing salt tabs. So it's been known forever that salt is good for us. And then once these dietary goals and guidelines came out, even athletes started becoming fearful of salt. But, but back in the 70s, 60s, 50s, very common that you were told to consume salt prior to working out. And the reason is, is because s- sweating is how we thermoregulate during exercise. And we lose a tremendous amount of salt. And it's way more than what any sports drink is going to give you. So most sports drinks, like Gatorade or Powerade, have about 300 milligrams of sodium per liter and yet your sweat is about 1,200 milligrams of sodium per liter. So you're literally losing out, your sweat is four times saltier than what you would be replacing if you're lucky enough to even be consuming something like Gatorade. Most athletes just consume tap water, not even realizing that they are losing 1,200 milligrams, which is a half a teaspoon of salt per liter of sweat. Yeah, it's uh, it's incredible in terms of even athletes training at... uh um, in warmer climates where, you know, sweat rates increase, you know, the, obviously, as you know, and as you cover in your book, you know, the need for, for salt even goes up and yeah, I mean, the sports drinks and whatnot just, just simply don't cover it. Now, uh, you also touch base on the impacts of even connective tissue and joints and how salt plays such a key role there. Yeah. Um, so for overtraining syndrome where people have muscle spasms and their, their joints ache, their muscles fatigue. Most of the time, it's due to tissue depletion of salt. And so one of the reasons is because obviously salt prevents muscle cramps. We know that. But there's this transporter of in order to get acid, hydrogen out of the cell, sodium needs to go into the cell. And so you can literally build up acid in the joints and in the muscles if you don't have enough salt. And obviously that can lead to muscle fatigue as well and joint pain. So one, one topic I do cover briefly in the book is how low salt diets can potentially be increasing joint pain and pain in people with rheumatoid arthritis because they're not able to kick out the hydrogen in the cell because they don't have enough sodium to kind of match those two ions going in opposite directions, so to speak. 